Good evening. I'm Maude Brzezinski, the Interim Co-Director of the Cantor Arts Center. Welcome to this evening's conversation focusing on When Home Won't Let You Stay. The museum is now open to the public, and we encourage you to come to see the exhibition before it closes on May the 30th. If you're in the Bay Area and want to visit the museum in person, you can find the details about how to visit on our website and also in the chat on this Zoom call. This exhibition is organized by Ruth Erickson, the Mannion Family Curator, and Eva Racine, the Barbara Lee Chief Curator, with Anna Pulagura, the Curatorial Assistant at the Institute of Contemporary Art, Boston. The Canner Art Center presentation is organized by Maggie Dufloff, Assistant Curator of Photography and New Media, and Jessica Ventura, Curatorial Assistant. We gratefully acknowledge support from the Halperin Exhibition Fund. I'm now going to turn things over to Maggie. Thank you so much, Maude, for that wonderful introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, as Maude said, I'm Maggie Detloff, the Cantor's Assistant Curator of Photography and New Media. And it's been my honor to shepherd this exhibition, which originated at ICA Boston, uh, to the Cantor and present it in our space. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight for our um, event, which is a conversation with Rina Saini Kalat, Migration and Maps. This event is presented in conjunction with our current exhibition, When Home Won't Let You Stay, um, which is closing in a few days. Please come and see it if you're in the area and you feel safe to. In tonight's event, um, Rena Kalat, whose work is in the exhibition, will be in conversation with Ruth Erickson, co-curator of the exhibition um, at ICA Boston, and myself. But before we begin, I'm going to give you some tips for participating in tonight's event and then briefly introduce the exhibition and then formally introduce our conversation participants, Rena and Ruth. Live captioning is available for this event tonight. Click on the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. You can select show subtitle, which displays three lines of text in real time overlaid along the bottom, and you can move that text box as it suits you or you can click view full transcript, which lets you scroll back up in case you missed something that was said. We'll have dedicated time for audience Q&A during about the last 15 minutes of the event at that time, or at any time during the conversation, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat. The panelists will all receive them. And during the Q&A portion, I'll be able to read those out for Rena and Ruth to respond to. So the exhibition considers how contemporary artists are responding to the unprecedented amounts of migration, immigration, and displacement of people all over the world today. The show features more than two dozen artworks by 18 artists who are from, live in, or work in over a dozen different countries. And the show highlights their very diverse responses to migration, ranging from personal accounts to poetic meditations. Migration is not a new phenomenon, but this exhibition also calls attention to how it changes over time through various political, economic, and social developments. The show is organized around several overlapping themes, which I'm sure Ruth can tell us much more about, um, but they explore ideas of home, sites and modes of transit, provisional structures like borders, and narratives of displacement and belonging. Personal, intergenerational, and cultural memory and storytelling um, play a large role in several of these themes as well. Rena Kalat's work that is featured in the exhibition, uh, this is an image of it, it's called Woven Chronicle. Um, it highlights the intersections of memory with the complex web of activities that co-constitute global economies, international relations, nation building, and migration. And I'm thrilled that Rena and Ruth, curator of this exhibition, could join us for our conversation today and talk to us about mapping such complicated issues in art and exhibitions, respectively. And now I will stop sharing my screen and introduce Rena and Ruth formally. So Rena Sani Kalat's practice spanning drawing, photography, sculpture, and video is concerned with ideas that hold each other in tension, barriers in a world of mobility, porosity in sites of Fisher, memorialization in the aftermath of amnesia, and the promise and illegibility of national legal documents. Memory is an important site of investigation to, to excuse me, regard not only what we choose to remember, but also how we think of the past. 
Kalat has researched various histories of migration, the drawing of political and social borders, the plunder of shared natural resources for national gain, and archives of disappeared people. And the figure of the hybrid has come to hold symbolic potential in Kalat's practice as a truant against dividing lines and divisive national narratives. Her work is widely exhibited at institutions like the Museum of Modern Art New York, Tate Modern London, Migros Museum of Contemporary Art Zurich, and many, many others. Uh, she's had solo exhibitions at the National Museum of Asian Arts in Guimé, Paris, the Manchester Museum, Offsite Vancouver Art Gallery, and again, many more. She's participated in many biennials, including the Bangkok Art Biennial, Havana Biennial, and Busan Biennial. And her works are part of several public and private collections um, there are so many to name that I won't, but um, I recommend going to her website to check it out because her, her CV is long and impressive. Um, and of course, we're joined by Ruth Erickson, who is the Mannion Family Curator at the Institute of Contemporary Art Boston, where she's curated over a dozen exhibitions with artists such as Kevin Beasley, Mark Dion, Wangechi Mutu, and Vivian Sutter, and is the co-curator of the current exhibition at the Cantor, When Home Won't Let You Stay, Migration Through Contemporary Art. She received her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 2014. She's currently at work on two new group exhibitions and related publications, a painting show about intimacy and interiority, and a large group exhibition on the idea of childhood. So I'm extremely grateful to Rena and Ruth for joining us for this event, especially because they're joining us from very different time zones. So Rena, thank you for getting up so early to speak with us. And Ruth, thank you for staying up late to speak with us. Um, and so let's dive in to get our conversation started. Um, I'd like to ask Rena if you could share some of your earlier works leading up to and including Woven Chronicle. Um, your interest in political and social borders and the violent ways that they cleave through land, populations, and nature really resonates with the legacies of the partition in India, um, which I know your family experienced. Could you tell us about this early work that addresses these histories of migration um, and uh, archives of disappeared people and how your childhood years and personal memories of uh, the history of partition might have informed your work? Thank you, Maggie, and it's it's a great pleasure to join all of you from Mumbai um, and uh, to see Ruth. And I think we uh, we sort of met in when the exhibition opened at the ICA, and since then it's been traveling and to Minneapolis and to Cantor, which of course I couldn't catch. But this is such a great way of uh, reconnecting. So. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, so maybe what I could do is in a way, I've sort of put together a few images from beginning from some really early works that I haven't really um, in fact looked at or shown in, in many, many years. So it was nice to just bring out a few images. I shall just share my screen. Um, um, so yeah, this is one of my really early works from the 90s and I just thought in the context of this exhibition to um, bring out this work, which was called Joined Family. And I mean, of course, sort of exploring the idea of the home as a personal space, but not just a space of belonging, shelter, but uh, uh, here as seen as a temporary sort of fragile corrugated paper construction, almost like a toy house. And uh, where I was sort of looking at the, uh, you know, three houses constructed one into the other, and this, this idea of the breakdown of the joint family set up into more nuclear families with this kind of embrace of modern values as we globalize. And, and um, I think, I was also exploring the ideas of the individual, the collective, and, and the sort of pulls and pressures between these kind of entanglements of an individual in society and so on. So yeah, it was kind of these very early explorations, but I just thought that uh, this work, which was again called Lines on My Farm, and uh, from a, a body of work called Orchard of Homegrown Secrets, where again, I was thinking of ideas of place, geography of 
identities that you're born in and those you those you inherit and those you acquired and accomplish over time and these kind of entanglements of our relationships between home and the world and and again some early work from um, you know when I was photographing people in the city and um, a lot of the works back then somehow because you know we live in a city that has so many different people and Mumbai is really one of those in a sense, built by migrants from various parts of the country. It's, it's the most cosmopolitan city. So having grown up uh, my early years in Bombay, sort of, you know, suburban Mumbai, one had the opportunity of having people from various different backgrounds of language. And, um, you know, you sort of grew up in this very rich environment and somehow, um, that sort of is what fed into the work here. One was looking at aspirations of people. And, uh, but I have, you know, very early began recording people uh, who would move into the city and um, for livelihoods and for other reasons. And um, there were a lot of early works that I made where um, this was to do with the flag, the Indian national flag, and, and you know, I was invited to be part of the Tiranga, which, uh, and I decided to sort of break down the bands of the flag, uh, which kind of very simplistic readings of the flag being that green symbolize Muslims and Stafan and Hindus and all the other communities. But I wanted to form this kind of jumbled mosaic of names that actually uh, represented people from, you know, it was also at a time, uh, just to give you context, that in 2002, one had begun to see great resistance towards outsiders in the city of Mumbai. And I, uh, and uh, th these kinds of um, prejudices within communities and these strains that uh, were quite evident. And I began to sort of, look at this sort of promise of democracy, uh, going back to the preamble of the constitution of India. And I sort of made this sort of mock document that had the address of the nation. And um, it was a way of thinking about those foundational values that, and what they really meant to us and the sort of um, our relationship as citizens vis-a-vis -vis the nation and the nation as a construct, which of course is a political construct, but how it sort of socially plays out and how sort of divisive politics uh, often uses identities I and mean, identity politics, which is so prevalent in, in various parts of the world. And, and uh, names became quite central to a lot of the work I did and the rubber stamp itself as a sort of bureaucratic apparatus that both uh, legitimizes, endorses, um, gives place to, to people, migrant. I mean, and that sort of the, the kind of um, the stamp as being one that, you know, uh, and of course, India being such a bureaucratic society, that became a kind of metaphor and, and a kind of the medium that I began working with. Nearly for a decade and a half, I worked with uh, several uh, official records of whether they were names of people or in this case, they were names of freedom fighters. And, and I was thinking about the sort of um, this kind of wound in the womb of, of a kind of tumor in the womb rather and 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 the form of the disputed territory that lies between India and Pakistan was being rocked back and forth uh, not knowing the fate of these citizens sort of held in suspense not really knowing which side they belong to and um, these were in several you know scripts in in Hindi, English, Gujarati, Marathi, Urdu, Bengali, and I sort of started working with, um, I, in those years, of course, it wasn't so easily available and digitized. So I would often send it to the various cities 
you know, in Calcutta, in Chennai, and get these rubber stamps made already. So much has changed since. Um, and so synonyms was a body of work that I made, which actually had names of people who'd gone missing in various regions, North, South, East, West, Central Zone, forming portraits of migrants that, um, <clears throat> where I was really thinking about the sense of anonymity of an individual where as you're scrolling through these names of people who've gone missing, it's almost a sense of um, uh, an individual in the whole as this kind of unit uh, in the sort of social construct. And, and, and the backs of the portraits were equally uh, important to me. So they were made like freestanding portraits that can be viewed on either side in the sort of uh, back as a um, as an individual in a sea of, of a crowd of and yeah and up close they really um, disintegrated and as you step back they coalesce um, to form the portrait and of course the way they were made was also um, you know I had to transfer it from say a board on which they were constructed and then in the act of reconstructing it on say a plexiglass, the additions and omissions really lent the portrait its final character. And um, these were out of records of missing people. And yeah, I'll just run you through some of these. Uh, this was this is in the collection of the National Taiwan Museum of Fine Arts. And, and looking at other um, names of people who were denied visas to various countries. And this was, of course, very sort of playfully made uh, barricades of which you, of course, see and are used functionally in the, uh, you see mostly at the airports. Maybe. And uh, they were formed with names of those who've been denied visas. And of course, uh, the denial of visa is so much based on notions of class, gender, nationality, religion, of how you really, um, and these were painted with flags of different nations. And, and they were all, almost used functionally in an exhibition where they could recur at different places and interject other works, and uh, which I later began to form webs, uh, this sort of web of global entanglements, of the movement of people, and yet, the, the kind of obstacles they face. And, and uh, I mean, there was a very, very large work that culminated into uh, a web that was displayed outside uh, the museum in, in, in Mumbai called the Bhavaraji Large Museum. And well, I didn't include those images because it's, it's about renaming of street names in Mumbai city that have changed from colonial names to indigenous names. Um, but yeah, going back to my early years, I sort of grew up, like I said, in suburban Mumbai. And, um, you know, when all this thought about the one thing that you took great pride in was the fact that we had every possible religion, you know, uh, that you could think of from around the world. And yet at some point, I guess those, um, that optimism that one had began to slowly erode. I mean, my own experience of growing up, uh, you know, while I was at art school, we experienced the 92 riots and the 2002 riots. And I think some of those ideas of inclusion and, and plurality were really being put into question. And I uh, was naturally, like many other artists, began to think about the legacies of partition and how those divisive histories are uh, sort of used in a way uh, for politics to really be played out in the city. And, yeah, we can talk about that later. But I just thought I'd just share with you some images of literally flying across the border between India and Pakistan and seeing this kind of um, the LOC, the line of control 
and which is of course uh, the ceasefire line that got frozen as a line of control between and this, this sort of no man's land, the territory between those two sides. And I, I spent a lot of time going to the Vaga Atari border, which is the little village through which the most controversial Ratcliffe line was drawn. So, I mean, the largest human migration in human history, um, which actually doesn't really get spoken of enough was during the partition of India and Pakistan and uh, where over 10 million people you know, had to move and, and um, within days cross the border by foot, by trains and by plane. And so I sort of wanted to bring together these two sides in a way to sort of collapse that in-between space. But I always was thinking about these long shared civilizational histories that are so deeply rooted and entrenched. And yet here in this case, the gates sort of are debarred the movement, like mobility and, and uh, the gates completely covered with sacred threads that is usually meant to be untied when wishes are fulfilled. And, as part of rituals in both Hindu temples and in, in mosques, um, which remained untied in this case. And uh, this was shown with, along with a large photo piece called Priest Crevice Contour that again uh, has been shown in several museums. Uh, but it actually traces the changing line of control between India and Pakistan before the ceasefire line got frozen. So these are maps um, from, 47, 48, uh, the 10 stages of the war as the territory morphs and change, changes shape and shifts. And, uh, but so much, I mean, here, of course, the body is almost treated like a document with these names uh, stamped, which are actually names of people who would signed up the sort of peace petition drafted in 2004 between General Pervez Musharraf and the Indian Prime Minister calling for peace in the region. And, um, and so much of these histories of partition had to do with um, the violation of women's bodies and through rapes and uh, this kind of mark making that it evoked. And these are the, I hope, how am I doing with time? I don't, and uh, so the same form of the disputed territory sort of recurred through a lot of the early works where in this case, it was a video where again, the same names on a bed of sand uh, were written in sand and slowly blown away much like the peace process that sort of didn't seem to be going anywhere and kept resurrecting and yet, uh, so there's the sense of optimism and yet, but yeah, I think I'll just leave you with a few images of the piece which is in the exhibition, um, which is, uh, so I first really was, uh, when I was invited to be part of the Gothenburg Biennial in 2011, that was curated by Sarat Maharaj called Pandemonium Mart in the Time of Contemporary Fever. And uh, I was thinking about the sort of trade between India, Sweden and, um, I didn't quite want to work with Jan and, and yet uh, Sarat was speaking about pandemonium as something that, you know, post 2008, the collapse, the, you know, global economy and, and how this sort of idea of the hurly-burly world, but yet um, what emerges through the state of chaos and this kind of imagination that, um, and to think of, on the one hand, there's this kind of uh, what appears to be uh, a completely entangled approach has this kind of underlying sense of order. And I, I began thinking about the movement of migrants historically from indentured labor, to agricultural societies, and more um, industrial and post-industrial societies. And, and I didn't quite want to work with Jan as, as again, its own associations with women. And, and I decided to work with the electric cable that uh, is both a transmitter of energy exchange, is communication cables, and her 
morphs into sort of barbed wires and fences. But I was tracing the movement of migrants historically. And, um, and this was based on an industrial map of how territories are, you know, societies that are in, you know, economies that are manufacturing and, and mining or industrializing and agricultural societies and so on. So the color gradations came from there and, and these, I began mapping the flows through various sources and following these migration routes. And yeah, so uh, the work of course is travel, like Maggie said, to various institutions. And each time I try and uh, look at, like for instance, when I showed it at MoMA, the curator, uh, Sean Anderson was really pointing out of how, how even as we speak, maps are constantly changing shape and form and the, the most recent sort of intervention between Sudan and South Sudan. And, and yeah, he was talking about how one could find a way to incorporate these as we make new iterations of the map. So this was at MoMA. Um, and of course, we can talk more about this work with the soundscape and yes. Wow. Thank you so much, Rena. That it was so fascinating to see such a deep dive into your UV and your practice um, and to see, you know, it's really tight collection of work on interrelated themes, which I find so, so compelling. Um, I want to ask Ruth to, to jump in at this point and tell us a little bit more about the exhibition, When Home Won't Let You Stay, um, and Ruth, how you came to choose Rena's work and this work in particular to include in the exhibition. It's an incredible work um, that Rena just mentioned has been shown in so many contexts, the Gothenburg International Biennial, um, Vancouver Art Galleries, Offsite Space, MoMA, and so many others. Um, and so did you think about the work in terms of the site specificity of the exhibition in Boston when you were selecting it? Thanks for the question. Thanks so much for inviting me to be in conversation tonight as well. Um, and I just have to say that, you know, I, we are so happy that When Home Won't Let You Stay could kind of find its final home um, at the Cantor. And it is really a, an amazing job you all have done. And I'm just so, so thrilled. Um, yeah, so I first saw the work, uh, I mean, I'll answer it first about this incredible piece that Rena has made. I first saw it at MoMA in 2016. And I think what, you know, what struck me about it was on the one hand, it's kind of like it is immediately readable. It's a map. We know this, you know, it has this kind of graphic quality of this line, you know, against this sort of dark painted surface. And yet the more time you spend with it, it's just like layers of an onion sort of peel back and it goes deeper and deeper. And so, and, you know, in some ways that was very much, I think, how the subject of migration and the experience is. Like we know it as a thing, we, we read about it, we sort of have a certain kind of understanding of it. But of course, every individual experience is individual and it's so, you know, intricately embedded with economics and with politics and with economic, you know, and ecological crises. So in some ways, I, you know, when we saw, when I saw this work and then sort of the work on the exhibition really started after, um, around 2017 was really when I started working on the exhibition, you know, I immediately thought back to this work because I thought what better could sort of be an opening to the show, could sort of state in a very quick way some of the sort of uh, issues at work, but then invite visitors to sort of spend more time with it. And I think one of the most surprising things that I saw in Boston as visitors were seeing this work is the ways in which they located themselves and the spaces or the countries or the borders that they knew personally with the kind of more global flows and the sort of more you know, conglomerates of, of continents and geopolitical relationships that are, are present and that are also mapped. And so that was really, and I, you know, I think we'll talk you know, more about the material, but even the way that it both shows movement and then the sense of the careful way that Rena has woven each of those continents or each of those countries also suggests a kind of barrier. And this language between movement and barrier also is very you know, symbolic and poetic. So it was a early work, I believe on our checklist. Um, and you know, we always had it as this idea to open the exhibition. 
And just to talk a little bit about the exhibition. Um, so, you know, I think there were sort of two things in 2017 when Ava Vespini and I really started working on it. One is that we had just come back from seeing some big um, international art shows in Europe. We had gone to Documenta, we had gone to um, the Venice Biennale, and very present in a lot of those shows, we were really struck by some of the works that uh, brought up issues of migration. I remember very distinctly Guillermo Galindo had these amazing holes of these boats, um, of these migrant boats that he had made into musical instruments. And so we kind of came back bubbling with these ideas of, of artworks that for us brought our understanding um, of issues of migration to such a profoundly deeper level, um, you know, beyond the kind of uh, information documentary age that in some ways we felt immersed in, you know, by reading about it through the news. Um, so I think that was one thing with sort of the global art world. And then very specifically, you know, for the kind of Boston context, and you asked about sort of that site, um, our museum is a sort of cantilevered building right over the Boston Harbor. And so when you come and visit the museum, you see, you know, ocean liners and boats that are passing through the harbor. The Logan Airport, which is an international airport, is also visible. So you see sort of planes taking off. So there's a sense of sort of a teeming port city. Uh, that is present. And the museum in that time also was starting to expand across the harbor and build a new space called the watershed. And in doing research into that neighborhood, which is an incredibly mixed neighborhood, we also learned that there was one of the second um, largest immigration processing site in the 19th century was located literally right across the harbor. So sort of uncovering, you know, and then I think it was a moment where a lot of People in museums were really starting to think about land acknowledgments and think about the displacement of indigenous peoples and really think about what that meant for the museum to be on land that, you know, uh, was indigenous land and was taken. So it was sort of this like, um, you know, mix of, I think, both sort of a global awareness of the amazing work that artists were making about issues of migration, as well as the sort of local context of what was happening within our specific museum that really sort of created this perfect moment to, to work on this exhibition. Wow, and I love too that you mentioned seeing people locating themselves in Woven Chronicle. And so the way that a, a work of art that is so globally focused can be read as very specific to whatever your specific area is. Um, geographic area or area of expertise, either way. Um, that's incredible. Um, actually, Rita, can we go back a slide so we can look more at uh, Woven Chronicle? Thank you. Oh, it's so fantastic. Um, while we have the, the visual up, um, I wanted to ask, Rina, if your thinking about this work has changed as a result of it being included in this show, if there were particular other works in the exhibition that you found to have similar or complementary um, themes. Um, and also, Ruth, if you had works in the exhibition that you see dovetailing with Rena's in particularly powerful ways, I think it'd be really fun to hear about that. Rena, do you want to go ahead and answer that first? Um, uh, you know, I mean, the, the map, the idea of the map as something that uh, is so dynamic and it's kind of, you know, shifting as we we speak because of the, the kind of uh, pulls, pressures and uh, sort of also how our, I mean, on the one hand, of course, this, this map is almost like the idea of the fiber optically connected world. It's sort of, uh, you know, through trade, technology, commerce, the, the way we've sort of blurred these lines, the kind of porosity of these borders, despite them being more and more regulated. Um, but I think how we view maps uh, has, you know, or, or rather the, the way we make these maps also change the way we see the world. And I mean, through these, the, the different exhibitions, I've really been able to think of I mean, the, the sort of last um, iteration of this was the sort of South Up map and uh, to look at how certain regions get more prominence over others. And, and the way we, these approaches to the map, of course, changes in each context, like you said, you know, having shown it here vis-a-vis -vis the works in the exhibition. Um, 
I've of course always enjoyed Dohusa's work, you know, or or um, I've shown with uh, Isaac Julian before, so I'm more familiar with their works and and of course spending time in the museum. Um, with, so I've I've really uh, enjoyed the show uh, when when I was at the uh, at the exhibition in Boston and with the Inca Shudan Paris work, for instance, but. Uh, uh, I mean, this this has a sound, uh, you know, constantly throbbing with high voltage electric current, deep sea drone sounds, and, and um, yeah, factory sirens. So I mean, the the map has so much to do with uh, ideas of labor and and you know of, of weaving, and, and that's another integral part of the work. Sorry, yeah. Go yeah, yeah. Um, I think that so in Boston, we paired this Rena's piece, which sort of opened the exhibition with a sculpture that unfortunately couldn't travel beyond Boston because it belonged, it would just been acquired by a museum, by the Museum of Houston. And it's a, um, a piece by an artist named Camilo Ontiveros, who's actually located in California. And it, it was, it's called Temporary Storage, The Belongings of Juan Manuel Montes. And Basically what it is, if you can imagine, it's all of the contents of the belongings of um, a young man's bedroom that sort of is piled on top of each other and bound with rope. And the story of Juan Manuel Montes is that he was the first um, person who was a DACA recipient to be uh, deported. And there's a lot of um, contention around sort of the circumstances of his deportation. And, you know, it is a, it's a very sort of singular, personal, meaningful story about an individual life that was completely uprooted by a political system and a sort of, you know, a system of, of power and of, you know, who can stay and who cannot. I mean, so much of the work that Rena has worked on for so long. And I think we did this. I mean, one thing is that the line is amazing in both of these works. I mean, the amount of labor that Rena's project, Rena's piece, you know, required the wrapping of each of those individual wires. Um, and, you know, and, and then those wires that are making the lines, many of them are twisted to sort of appear like barbed wire. So it has this incredible sort of craft element of the hand. And we were interested in the formal relationship of the line and these lines that are sort of in space. And then I think also to sort of heighten that intensity of a singular story, a single individual with the sort of masses of people and goods that Rena's piece documents. We were really interested in, you know, bringing that into dialogue. Um, another work, which is in the, um, entryway to the canter is Tanya Brigera's flag, um, Dignity Has No Nationality. Did I say that right? Um, and, you know, it is another great flag piece that for us was right in the um, sort of elevator shaft of our building. And this flag documents, you know, the, the world sort of before Pangea when it was all one um, mass of land. And thinking about exactly as you just said, Rena, the way that, you know, these maps are their own abstractions and, you know, land is changing both on a sort of geological time scale of how the land has moved and has changed and is continuing to change, especially as seas rise and, you know, and then at the same time, how they're changing because of political um, and geopolitical sort of change. So, you know, I would point to that work as another work for which mapping and a, a sort of activist statement around citizenship and the rights of migrants um, is, you know, really comes to mind as well. Wow. That is so fascinating uh, to hear from both of you kind of which artworks you see as being so directly in conversation with Rena's. And um, I'll just jump in and point out my virtual background, which is the work installed at the Cantor. Um, and you can see on a, a, a wall in a different part of the space is Ito Barada's work, which I actually see that's one of the connections that I like to make between uh, Rina Kalat's work and Ito Barada's work um, in thinking about um, ease and disease of travel. So who or what travels easily across the globe or in Ito Barada's case across the Strait of Gibraltar um, and what is, what is effectively blocked or what the obstacles are. So it's just fascinating that the show has so many wonderful inter interconnection. So great job, Ruth, and uh, <laughs> wonderful work, Rena. Um, many of the things that you both said reminded me of other questions that I wanted to ask. Um, so, and also my cat says, hello, she's enjoying the event. Um, 
wanted to go back to uh, the subtitle of tonight's event, Migration and Maps. Um, the use of the map in Woven Chronicle, of course, was the inspiration for this subtitle, but I was also thinking about other kinds of visualization, artworks, exhibitions of artworks, um, and questions about what role uh, visualizations can play in understanding these sorts of complicated issues like migration um, or feelings of belonging and home. So just wanted to ask what you each feel is the, the role of visualization, how important or unimportant is visualization to tackling such difficult themes and issues? You know, as artists, of course, you're, um, there, there's always, there's one aspect to the work that is to do with reimagining the way you see the world and, and hopefully as you present work, um, it evokes the kind of emotional and intellectual responses that provoke people to think, question, um, and I think, yeah, I think that's a real privilege as an artist that you enjoy. I think uh, that you see the world and, and um, of course, each of us bring our own lenses to how we see. In fact, much of the work that I make actually is about this kind of uh, inability to uh, be able to understand other perspectives. And so this, this idea of, uh, not only how our own, to, to have the sort of self critique of our own perceptual limitations of how we see things and experience things because so much of what we bring uh, to an, an episode and, and an event is not just what really occurs, but how we perceive that based on our own preconceived ideas, our own preconditioning and, and um, to be aware of that uh, while we make work. Um, and equally then to see that it allows for several ways and approaches because as an artist, you know that um, even what I make, I don't fully understand. And I think I really look to people to um, be able to shift meaning and see new meanings. And as long as it can continue to remain open-ended and, um, and yeah, the power of visualization is one thing, but how uh, it gets embedded with new meanings. And like I said, yeah, that's something that the viewer brings. Yeah, and I would just add, I mean, I think that one of the things we were really self-conscious about in this exhibition is that oftentimes migration gets visualized in a very narrow way in the primary popular media that, you know, the vast majority of the population sort of experience it by. And, you know, that is, um, you know, more easily consumed. It's perceived to be documentary. There's a kind of perception of objectivity about it. Um, and, you know, and often it presents experiences of migration as, you know, very dehumanizing of which they are. But I think we were really sensitive in this exhibition that we, there's very few works that are documentary. I think Richard Moss is sort of the closest, um, but we were seeking works that brought out what we felt like art had the special potential to do, maybe distinct from sort of a journalism or journalistic photography, which was really about a sort of multi-sensory experience, an experience that, you know, I, I myself having mostly seen art on screens for the past 15 months, you know, long for and, um, you know, and to walk into the show and hear the, si hear the sounds of boats and sort of have that be part of an experience of this work. So many of the works that we have included in the exhibition, like Isaac Julie and Nika Shonebari, are these really large scale works. And part of that was works that we felt like were sort of immersive, transporting, that sort of talked about place and about sort of uprooting and uprooted the person from where they were to sort of bring them into a different space. And so I think that sense of, you know, not only visualization, but something that is maybe goes beyond the visual that is, you know, actually, in fact, really experiential and somatic and emotional and sort of triggers all of the senses. And for me, that's totally the special kind of purview of, of artwork. And 
and and its unique contribution to um, you know a subject like this and like many other subjects that are complex and pressing and you know feel so kind of urgent and also hard to kind of get your arms around it sort of felt like something we just had to really immerse ourselves in um, through the sort of vision of artists like Rena. Wow, absolutely. And I'm I'm struck by your mention of um, you know the contrast between the way that art can represent things or does represent things and the way we often see things. Because um, I'm thinking back to the kind of preparatory materials and research that you did, Rena, um, and even the way that you've used um, color coding for the various levels of industrialization of the countries in the map. So there's a way that this, you know, this factual information is represented, it's visualized in this artwork, but it goes so far beyond being an infographic. Um, and part of that, of course, is the layering, and part of it is the weaving, the way that you've worked with the materials, and also the sound component. Um, so I, I definitely want to leave time for audience questions, but I can't help but ask one more question. Um, Rena, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, how you use, how you've used weaving um, in your work, and maybe also a little bit about sound, if we have a few minutes. Sure. I mean, um, so I really had to, you know, it's not something that um, you, with each work, I literally learn new skills and um, to be able to make something that I think about. And um, I think the act of weaving was for me uh, to create this kind of almost like a tapestry and uh, a web work of, um, like I said, underground sea cables of, um, and yet thinking about these lines as, as, as something that are drawn across territory and have huge implications of pe on people on both sides. I mean, um, thinking of, of course, uh, this, this kind of, uh, you know, as I began forming these fence patterns and making barbed wires, it kind of became a, a recurrent lead motive through a lot of the other works. In fact, if we have time, we can just run through some other works as well, which have the same uh, work with weaving. Of course, this was, um, Sorry, I think I shouldn't jump maybe. Um, but yeah, there are some later works which we can look at, which we call leaking lines, for instance. And um, sorry, also about the sound you, you mentioned. Sound, like I said, had factory sirens, ship horns, communication tones, deep sea drone sounds. And, um, and again, with Ruth, I, I kept telling her, I hope it doesn't you know, disrupt the, the sound sort of overlaying on other works in the exhibition. But that's one of the key things that one works with. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's all of these different lines that I've been working with, whether it's the Radcliffe line that was drawn, you know, between India and Pakistan, but then there's the Duran line between say Afghanistan, Pakistan, or the, Rad, the uh, blue line, the green line, the Curzon line, and so, I've also been exploring these various, um, uh, you know, whether they were lines that were built during the wars, fortifications. So, yeah, this this idea of the territory is something that is, you know, um, uh, you know, almost replacing the pencil with the wire, the electric cable that's so charged as a conduit. Of uh, you know, connectivity and yet uh, holds these sort of inherent contradictions of being both a conduit carrier and a barrier at the same time. And... I'm so thrilled with this, uh, the Leaking Lines project, which is a little more recent. Um, this is either on view now or it's going to be on view soon in a solo exhibition of yours, right, Rena? That's right. It opens in Sweden uh, on the 19th of June, in fact, and um, that will be shown at the Nordhal Kunsthalle in Sweden. Uh, but for uh, these sound-based works, which, which again are actually, I mean, a lot of the, the figure of the hybrid between two sides, I mean, I almost look at those spaces of transition as uh, not just culturally diverse, uh, but 
ecologically diverse and often we look at uh, you know, the natural world to sort of tune into the signals from the natural world where species have always cohabited, uh, you know, and native to a particular land don't really divide borders like, you know, like we do and these impositions of uh, those unseen lines, which um, in this case are actually modeled on pre-radar acoustic devices that were built during the wars to track sounds of enemy aircrafts and here sort of catch signals of birds from various countries uh, in conversation. So you have the hoopoo singing to the Palestinian sunbird, you know, the hoopoo from Israel singing to the Palestinian sunbird or the crested caracara from Mexico calling out to the eagle from US, the national symbols or the national birds of various countries. And yeah, so these are more recent uh, works that deal with sound but um, yeah, we can continue to talk about the works in the exhibition. Wow, that is so excellent. Um, so we've got about five minutes left and we've got a few questions in the chat. So I'll go ahead and read some of those. Uh, Jim asks, Rena, what were the terms being conveyed by the deed of understanding you showed beneath a bank note? Could you say more about that piece in relation to the influence of money, hierarchy, and law on migration and its causes? Um, well, that was actually the, the preamble to the Constitution of India. So, I mean, to think of all the values of, say, uh, not just peace, liberty, equality, justice that are promised to every citizen and how those often get denied and, and uh, of how we make invisible certain people by actually not entitling them to those rights. And uh, I mean, a lot of the works I, I have been exploring, not just the constitution, beginning with the constitution of say India and then Pakistan, but then also of Ireland, U not Ireland, UK, sorry, UK doesn't even have a the written constitution, but there's North and South Korea, Serbia, Croatia. And um, so it's really, I mean, I, I sort of explore these um, commonalities through difference. That's something that I'm always seeking to look for and how we seem to be uh, having, we have seem to be losing sight of our shared values where we are constantly battling over our differences. And, most of the works, in fact, uh, that I was showing you were, uh, which actually I didn't have a chance to show you. Maybe I'll quickly do that so that you can get a sense of how they, um, sorry, is my screen visible? No, nope, not seeing it yet. I think leave that. I just uh, talk about the work because I've been working with constitutions of various different countries that are, uh, like I said, I mean, I'm always interested in these long shared civilizational histories and how uh, we're sort of losing sight of those common shared values. So in fact, all of those videos had people trying to read the constitution. And again, this idea of the legibility and illegibility of texts that are legal documents and how we're, we're kind of not every citizen is is um, is able to access and and um, yeah and be part of that uh, what is promised to each citizen and uh, so through those through those videos I've actually had all of these constitutions it's actually a thirteen channel videos uh, you know it's a large work which I'm slowly developing and we're going to be showing eight out of the 13 in Sweden, which are an alphabet at a time. So there's always this kind of idea of the fragment in the whole and are kind of holding on to these half truths and half realities and each side really holding on to their own truth, which is probably di disputable when you think of it from another perspective. And so a lot of the work is really looking at these bonds beyond the borders essentially, and, and our own perceptual limitations in seeing. Excellent. Jim says, intelligibility, yes, thank you. Um, and let's see, another question. Henrietta asks, 
Are there any resolutions in your work where some of the challenges of migration are solved or resolved? That's an interesting question. I'm not sure if I'm really providing answers, but I think uh, the exploration of this is also to sort of draw our attention to um, all that's shared as, you know, in humanity. I mean, I've, I've been, you know, so much of what we see in nature, I, I often think of how, not just how we've looked at land and water resources as points of conflict because of the sort of um, the limited shared resources we have. And, and, and then to, to try and see how water can probably be a source of transboundary agreements as something that we all depend on. So, I mean, I think through the work, one is trying to look for what could possibly be the areas of, of our collaboration, of our solidarities, of how we can extend ourselves to uh, try and look for ways of these, um, yeah, transboundary collaborations, which, and also there are a lot of success stories that you can look at. So it's not all um, black and dismal, yeah. That's such an important function of art, isn't it? Um, so I think we have time for one last quick question. Uh, Sarah asks a great uh, question. Your work deals with political and social issues. What inspired you? Um, you know, it's not that one really um, began. A lot of times I'm asked, did you begin working out of the space of social responsibility? I don't think, I mean, I began from a, a feeling that I have to be, uh, you know, it, I don't think my work, I sort of work quite organically. I develop ideas from one to the other and and I don't really sort of pre-decide necessarily where I'm going to be taking the work, but I think it's sort of intuitively prompted by responding to, of course, I mean, we are shaped by where we live and what transpires around us. And, and I think um, our, my early childhood years, I had sort of grown up listening to stories about partition and, and a little bit because I've had no real experience of, uh, you know, I've had a very secure upbringing in the city of Mumbai. And yet uh, I've known of my father's brother who moved during partition. And so I think somewhere there was uh, the impact of what these stories meant, of what these untold stories. In fact, there was so much silence around the moment of partition that also at some point I began to think about and, and memory, I think has such a strange way of, um, you know, rearranging our thinking of between, um, you know, there's certain things that get ignited and incited at different times. And so, um, yeah, I think it's really how circumstances around you also provoke you to think about uh, your political situation in, in Mumbai. Wow, that's such a fantastic and an inspiring answer, I think. Um, and that also reminds me to just ask Ruth, one of your current exhibitions that you're working on is about childhood. Um, do you wanna tell everyone a little bit of what they could come and see in, at ICA Boston if they have the time? <laughs> sure, yeah, I'd love to. Um, you know, this like the migration show has sort of been many years in the works um, and it came out of the experience of becoming a parent and having my generation of artists, many of whom also became parents. I mean, when Rena and I first met, I got a chance to meet your son. Um, and, and then it sort of led me on this project thinking about the long history of artists being inspired by childhood as this kind of font of creativity, you know, from like Paul Clay and Kandinsky and those sort of European modernists on up to the present. So the show really traces that. It traces how artists have derived inspiration from childhood internationally and intergenerationally. And, you know, so there's ideas of like untutored line and drawing, there's ideas of caretaking, storytelling and enchantment, um, and then also sort of unschooling and schooling and the ways in which children, I think, are 
incredible at learning, you know, on the margins of institutions. Um, so it's it's been a it's been a it's a project that has about uh, I think just about 35 artists in it. So you know, it's not it, it's not sort of a huge so it's not meant to be a survey. How could you ever make a survey of childhood? Kind of like migration, but I think like when home won't let you stay, it's meant to sort of offer in depth some of what I think are the most interesting ways that artists are continuing to sort of bring forward and think about issues that like migration are sort of as long as human history and also feel you know really urgent right now and I would say the COVID-19 pandemic if anything has sort of shown the crisis of childcare, the crisis of education and sort of now with this being the largest unvaccinated population what it means from a public health standpoint so it's a, it's a really great time to be working and thinking about the show and thinking about it anew kind of from the vantage point of, of today. Wow. That sounds fantastic. We all have so much to look forward to. If you're in Sweden, go see Rina's show. <laughs> if you're in Boston, go see Ruth's show. Over the next five days, if you're in the Bay Area, please come see When Home Won't Let You Stay at the Cantor. Um, and with that, I will just wrap us up. Thank you so much, Ruth for joining us tonight. Thank you, Rena, for this really stimulating conversation. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight for a conversation with Rena Kalat, Migration and Maps. We look forward to seeing you again soon, whether in person or online. As I mentioned, the show is up for another five days. Here is the information. You can go reserve your ticket on, online free. Um, and I also encourage you to check out our exhibition website. Um, you may know that this show opened virtually at the Cantor first. And so we have a very robust website, which will live on after the show closes. So it's a wonderful way to continue to engage with Rena's work and the other works in the show. Um, so thank you again so much for coming tonight. Thank you, Ruth Erickson and Rena Klott. Really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you so much. Uh, Ruth for joining us.